get started, let me pray for us here. Thank you so very much, Lord, for letting us all be here. Father, I just pray that our hearts will be open to your word and what you have for each of us. Father, please put the distractions outside the door. Please help us to do that. Please drive Satan far from here so that just for this time, Lord, this short time, we can just put our focus completely on you. Father, please bless and protect your people in Israel. Lord, please bless and protect Jerusalem. Father, uh, we know that you are the God of the impossible, and we just ask you to protect them. We pray that so many are coming to know you, Jesus, as Savior and Lord, as a result of this. And Lord, please just go before them, give the leaders great wisdom and discernment. And Lord, we're just watching to see the next magnificent, wonderful thing that you're going to do. Thank you, Jesus, for the way you love us, and thank you for what you did on the cross. In your precious name, amen. Today, we're going to be looking at Proverbs 4, 23 to 27. It's uh, above all else, guard your heart. Um, let me just, well, first, I got to get out of the way the thing that has nothing to do with anything, but I like it like I do. So for weeks, a couple had been arguing about buying a vehicle. He wanted a truck. She wanted a fast little sports car that could zip through traffic around town. He would have been satisfied with any old beat-up truck, but everything she wanted was way out of their price range. Look, she said, I want something that goes from zero to 200 in just a few seconds. Nothing else will do. My birthday's coming up, so surprise me. He did just that. For her birthday, he brought her a brand new bathroom scale. <laughs> and, and this is my favorite part. Get this. Nobody has seen or heard from him since. <laughs> Go, girl, right? All right. So above all else, above, when, when a verse starts, when, when, when God tells us something and he says above all else, that ought to stop us in our tracks, right? Above all, above all else, guard your heart, for it is the wellspring of life. In the Hebrew, it's emphatic. It says guard it with all guardedness, okay? Guard your heart. Guard it with all guarded, guardedness. And then as the verse goes on, it says, put away from you crooked speech. We talked about that a lot last week. We talked about griping and unforgiveness, holding grudges and gossip. We, we looked at the positive side, gratitude, but gratitude wouldn't be included in this. It says, put away from you crooked speech. So we're guarding our heart. And in the very next verse, he talks about our mouths, heart, mouth connection, okay? And then he said, let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. So there's a a heart-eye connection, a heart-mouth connection, ponder the path of your feet, and then all your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. So look at what he's connecting into our heart, our eyes, our mouth, our feet. So we're going to look at all those things as we see what it means to guard our hearts with all guardedness. Above all else, you guard that which is most precious. Okay, you guard that, which is most precious. And in Hebrew, that word guard, it's a military term. It means to fence, to block off, to protect, to keep out what shouldn't be in. That's what it means in Hebrew. You guard that, which is the most precious. The tomb of the unknown soldier. It houses the uh, inside is America's finest. Here rests in honor glory an American soldier known only to God. Tomb of the unknown soldier. The tomb contains the remains of unknown American soldiers from World War I to the Korean War and the Vietnam War. Each was presented with a Medal of Honor at the time of internment. It's guarded 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, by specially trained members of the 3rd United States Infantry Measurement, or Regiment. They're called the Old Guard. It's right near Fort Myers, Virginia. The guard walks 21 steps back and forth before the tomb, it alludes to the 21-gun salute, which is the highest honor given to any military or foreign dignitary. The guards are changed every 30 minutes, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. The guards must commit to two years of life to guard the tomb. They live in a barracks under the tomb. They can't drink alcohol on or off duty for the rest of their lives. They can't swear in public for the rest of their lives. They can't disgrace the uniform or the tomb in any way. After two years, the guard is given a wreath pin that's worn on their lapel, signifying they served as the guard of the tomb. There's only 400 presently worn. The guard must obey these rules for the rest of their lives or give up that wreath pin. The first six months of duty, a guard can't talk to anyone nor watch TV. 
All off-duty time is spent studying the 175 notable people laid to rest in Arlington National Cemetery. Every guard spends five hours a day getting his uniform ready for guard duty. Look at the, lifelong or the life commitment to this. You guard what is precious. In 2003, as Hurricane Isabel was approaching Washington, D.C., the Senate and the House took two days off with the anticipation of the storm. We will let that one go without comment. Um, on ABC Evening News, it was reported that because of the dangers from the hurricane, the military members assigned to the guarding of the tomb were given permission to suspend the assignment. They respectfully declined the offer. No way, sir. Soaked to the skin, marching in pelting rain of a tropical storm, they said guarding the tomb of the unknown soldier was not just an assignment. It was the highest honor that could be afforded to a service person. Deep within our hearts is an honored guest. If you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've got the Holy Spirit within you. How are you guarding him inside your heart? Look at the great lengths these guys are going to for a worldly thing, out of respect and dedication and duty, but how are we guarding that Holy Spirit within our heart? And how does he help us in the guarding process? We're going to be looking at that a lot today. John Flavel said the greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God. Okay? The greatest difficulty in conversion is to win the heart to God. And the greatest difficulty after conversion is to keep the heart with God. Unfortunately, a lot of us have allowed our hearts to be full of trash and weeds. Let any riffraff knock on the door, and we throw it open. If anger wants to take root, we show it to the perfect spot. When revenge needs a place to stay, we let him pull up a chair. When pity wants to have a party, we show him to the patio. When lust rings the bell, we change the sheets on the bed. Why don't we know how to say no? And what do we need to guard against? What does it look like? It's anything that wants to overtake your heart. And it can be different for all of us, different things at different times. We need to guard against idolatry, choosing another God, whether it's ourself or something else. Jealousy, lust, unforgiveness, anger, hatred, envy. It goes on and on and on. How do we guard our hearts? And I'm glad you asked because for the next hour, that's what we're working on. Go to Genesis 4. We're going to look at some examples today of people who didn't and then look at how we can have victory and do it. Genesis chapter 4, beginning with verse 1. The bottom line is Satan and God are both knocking on the door of your heart. Who are you going to open it to? Okay, Satan and God are opening on the door of your heart, or knocking on the door of your heart. Who are you going to open it to? Genesis 4 begins, Now Adam knew Eve as his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain, and saying, saying, I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. It seems as if Eve's understanding, God promised a deliverer after the fall in the garden, and that's Genesis 3.15. It appears that Eve thought Cain was going to be the deliverer. I have gotten a man with the help of the Lord. You know what Cain means? Cain means here he is. Okay, that's what it means in Hebrew. Here, how would you like to be named that? I think that would be pretty cool. Here she is, all right? Your pride might puff up a little bit. But Cain, his parents, here he is. They thought that in their understanding, he might be the one to deliver everyone from sin. So there's Cain, and then she bears another, and his name's Abel. Abel mean, means weakness. So we've got here he is, Cain, and we've got weakness, Abel. Now, in the course of time, that's important in uh, verse 3, in the course of time, in the Hebrew, that means at the end of days, at the end of the season. That could be at the end of, of the growing season. It could be harvest time. It could be at the end of the week. But at the end of days, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. So I always remember Cain crops and, and Abel animals. And Abel brought the firstborn of his flock and their fat portion. So just stop for a second and look at that. Cain brings the works of his hands, okay? The works of his hands, something he grew. And then Abel brings the first of the flock and the fat portions. Ab Abel brings the best of the best, the firstborn and the fat. And I put on there, um, on your note sheet, it's Leviticus 3, 16 and 17, and Leviticus 17, 6. The fat was a luxury. So Abel comes to God and he gives him the very best thing he has. Whereas Cain, whether it was moldy strawberries or something that was left over towards the end of the harvest, whatever, that's what Cain brought. They both showed God 
what he was worth to them. That's what worship is, right? Worth-ship. In our worship, we show God what he means to us. Well, look at what he meant to Cain. Here's, here's some old this or that. Look what he meant to Abel. First, best, finest. And we, we get some deeper insight into it. If you go to the Hebrews Hall of Fame later, look at Hebrews Hall of Fame. It's, it's chapter 11. It talks about, in verse 4, it talks about Abel. It said, by faith, Abel gave his offering. He engaged his heart. By faith, he gave this. The righteous shall live by faith. Okay, just like we've talked about, God opposes the proud and gives grace to the humble, right? That's in the Bible three times. Once in the Old Testament, twice in the New. The righteous will live by faith. That's in there three times also. Once in the Old, twice in the New. It's in there in Habakkuk 2.4. The righteous shall live by faith. It's in Romans 1.17. The righteous shall live by faith. It's in Galatians 3.11. The righteous shall live by, shall live by faith. A way to, easy way I remember it is, the just shall trust. If you can just understand that, the just shall trust. The righteous will live by faith. And it says righteous, or Abel was righteous. So when you see that in Hebrews eleven four, Jesus talks about Abel. He talks about the righteous blood of Abel, or the blood of the righteous Abel. That's in uh, Matthew twenty three thirty five. So somebody was knocking at the door of both their hearts. Who did they open it to? So Abel gives his best, and Cain gives God whatever. Satan was raising Cain, but God was able. Okay? Just think about it that way. Satan is raising Cain, but God is able. Okay? Look at how that points. (laughs) But look what happens. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering because God sees our hearts. And he knew what was being given and why it was being given. And Abel saying, this is what you're worth to me, God, the best and the finest. So he looked with favor on Abel and his offering. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Cain could have fixed it. But Cain wasn't guarding his heart. So look where he went. He went to anger. And when it says, so Cain was very angry, that in the Hebrew means exceedingly. Cain got ticked off. Instead of trying to fix it, instead of making it right, instead of going to the Lord and saying, I'm sorry, I didn't give you my best, will you help me? Can can I go forward with you? But no, instead, he got angry. And the Lord works with him. Why are you angry? Why is your face fallen? God is a wonderful counselor, a wonderful counselor. Counselors ask questions to help you get to where you need to be. They try to help you get to the solution themselves. Except type A counselors, who I might know one, they prefer just to tell you what to do and move on. But but that's what good counselors do. They ask questions. They bring it forth. And so that's what God's doing. Why are you angry? Let's, let's, Let's look at this. God's still working with them. He didn't say, you know, you don't think I'm worth a whole lot, so off you go. The Lord is still working with him. If you do well... Will you not be accepted? Another question. And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is to have you, but you must rule over it. Look at that picture. God's knocking on the door of your heart. That's, that's Revelation 3.20. And that's not, everybody wants to make that an evangelistic verse, but look at it. God's talking to the church of Laodicea. He's saying, I'm knocking at the door. Are you going to let me in? And then you've got Satan knocking at the door. And look at this, sin is crouching outside your door, and it desires to have you. That's the crouching, it's a word they use of cats, just waiting to, you know, jump on their prey. They crouch, they wait, and that's what God's saying. Who are you going to open the door to, Cain? Me or Satan? And we have that same choice all the time. You hear this juicy piece of gossip, like we talked about last time. Do you keep it to yourself, or do you go blab? Who's knocking on the door of your heart? Who are you going to open it to? God, and just keep it to yourself because you love people more than you love having insider status? Or are you going to open it to Satan and just go start talking about people? Sin is crouching at your door, and its desire is to have you. Sin is subtle. Remember 2 Corinthians 11.3. Paul said, but I'm afraid just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's serpent's coming, your mind may be somehow led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. It's easy to let it sneak up on us. The 
For eight years, Sally had been the Romero family pet. When they got her, she was only a foot long. But Sally grew until eventually she reached 11 and a half feet and weighed 80 pounds. Then on July 20th, 1993, Sally, Sally a Burmese python, turned on 15-year-old Derek, strangling the teenager until he died of suffocation. The police said the snake was quite aggressive, hissing and reacting as they went to investigate. Look at that. They let this thing grow up in their family, and then it kills their teenage son. Why? Why would you bring something like that into your home? Why do we bring pornography into our homes? Why do we bring filthy language on the TV into our homes? What are we allowing in our homes? They let that in. And you know, let's just get to it right now. You are not the exception. I am not the exception. We need to take God's word at face value. I've been thinking about that all week. I've never heard that before, but a pastor who I can't even remember who he was because I read so many sermons and listen to so many, but he said, take God's word at face value. Do the do's and don't do the don'ts. How hard is that? Do the do's, don't do the don'ts. You are not the exception. If God says don't do it, don't do it. Here's another animal example. This lady finds a baby raccoon, okay? And they, they can be pretty cute, I guess, when they're little. And she brings it into her home and names it Bandit. She happened to have a friend who was a zookeeper. And he said, you don't understand. He may look cute now, but raccoons go through a glandular change at about two years old. He said, and I never knew this, you might have, but it said a 30-pound raccoon has the strength of a 100-pound dog when it's attacking, okay? She brought this into her home. She was warned this is what happens when they turn two. There's this glandular change, and it's going to get aggressive. She said, that won't happen. Bandit won't do that. Guess what happens? A little bit after she'd had it for two years, it attacks her, goes for her face, and she ends up needing all this plastic surgery. Okay? She was not the exception, nor are we. Do the do's, don't do the don'ts. It's that simple. But it's not. We're going to look at Solomon in a little while. The wise guy, the wisest man in the whole world. Solomon didn't do the do's and didn't do the don'ts. He didn't guard his heart. The wisest man in the whole world didn't guard his heart. So how can we? We ask the Lord for help. Because Jesus said very plainly, apart from me, you can do nothing. Point blank. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's John 15, 5. That's my life verse. Apart from him, I can do nothing. Okay? Do the do's. Don't do the don'ts. God has put guardrails up for us. Let's use a couple driving examples here. He has put guardrails up in his word. Do this, and it'll go well with you. Don't do this, and it'll go well with you. He's put up guardrails. Think about when you drive up Kingsbury grade. Aren't you glad those guardrails are there? As you look over the side or when you're coming down 50, aren't you glad they're there? God's put guardrails in his word to protect us. And you know what? How about those rumble strips? I'll admit, I'm, I'm, I'm not a great driver. So sometimes I wander onto those rumble strips. And I make an excuse. Well, I'm just making sure this road still has them. Okay? I just want to make sure they still work. But you know what? You have a rumble strip in your heart. The Holy Spirit. When you get off God's path, here, he starts rumbling in your heart. Hey, girl, got a problem here. Hey, why are you doing that? What are you thinking? Why are you saying that? Come on, this little rumble strip. Holy Spirit, red flags going up. Look what God has done for us. Don't ignore those. Don't ignore those. We're not the exception. The Great Wall of China. Only the man -made, it's the only man-made structure that can be seen on the moon, right? Well, that's a myth. You can't see the moon. You can't. The Wall of China, the Great Wall of China is great, but not that great. It's 2,149 miles long, built over a period of 2,000 years, built so high that nobody could climb it, so thick nobody could break it down. Yet during the first 100 years of the wall's existence, China was invaded three times. Not once did they break down the wall or climb over it. How did they get in? They bribed the gatekeepers and went right through. Walls, guardrails, our Holy Spirit rumble strip are meant to protect us. We need to keep Satan out. Cain didn't guard his heart, and look where it led to. God is trying to talk him out of sin. 
God, the creator of the universe is trying to protect this guy from himself. Show him how to guard his heart. But we know how it ends up. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother. And when they're in the field, Cain raises up, rises up against Abel and kills him. And then God says, where is Abel, your brother? God knew. Just like when Adam and Eve sinned. And they went and hid behind a bush and put the fig leaves, leaves over their privates and all that, right? God comes and says, where are you? God knew but he wanted them to know he was looking. Same thing with Cain. Where is Abel? God knew, but he wanted him to know, I'm looking, I see what you did. I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. And then he goes forth and he said, and now you're cursed from the ground. Cain had every chance to get it right. Every chance, God himself talked to him. The Holy Spirit talks to us through our rumble strip, through the, the still small voice. We can't ignore it like Cain did. Cain ends up with a curse. He gets cast out. Heart work is the hardest work. There's great competition for our hearts. Satan desperately wants your heart, and God does too. Heart work is constant work. Sin is crouching at the door. Heart work is the most important work above all else. So it's the hardest work, great competition for your heart, constant work, sin is crouching at your door, and heart work's the most important above all else. But like I mentioned, Solomon, even the wise guy, didn't guard his. First, first Kings 11. I'm just going to give you a little bit of background. We're just going to fly through the first 10 chapters and just hit highlights so we can get to chapter 11, what we're looking at. So remember, David is Solomon's daddy. Solomon's anointed king. When David's time to die drew near, that's in 1 Kings chapter 2, David said, I'm about to die. Be strong. Take the charge of the Lord your God. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes, his commandments, his rules, his testimonies. Keep, do what God says. What, what great instruction for a father to give his son. Solomon, going forward, you're going to be the king. Do what God tells you to do. And then chapter 3 opens with the first chink. Okay, Solomon made a marriage alliance with the Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and he took Pharaoh's daughter. What's the problem with that? The problem is God had told his people, when you go into the promised land, don't intermarry because they're going to take you away from me. If you take a foreign wife, she's going to lead you to her gods, the little g-gods. She's going to turn your heart against me. Do not intermarry with foreign women. And here's Solomon. What does he do? He marries a foreign woman right off. God asked Solomon, what do you want? What would you like me to give you? It's like a genie in the bottle thing, only it's God. Okay, what do you want, Solomon? And Solomon says, I want wisdom and discernment. This is in chapter 3. I want wisdom and discernment so I can govern your people well, Lord. God was so pleased with his answer that he not only gave him wisdom and discernment, smarter than anybody's ever been, he gave him great riches and wealth too because he hadn't been selfish about it. So God lavishes all these blessings on him. Smartest guy ever, wisest guy ever, and then here's all the wealth in the world to Solomon, everything. And as you read through these chapters, it just goes on and on and on about all the stuff Solomon had, how smart he was. Chapter 4, verse 29, and God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding behind measure and breadth of mind like the sand on the seashore. Talks about he spoke 3,000 proverbs like the one we're looking at today. 1,005 songs. Solomon was given all these incredible gifts, and he was given one that his father David was never given. Remember, David was a man of war. Always. David was fighting from the outside. He was fighting on the inside. He was fighting his lust, and as we know, he lost. But David wasn't about perfection, as none of us are. He was about pursuit. And that's why he was called a man after God's own heart, right? David messed up a lot, but he never, ever gave up on God. He just kept going so hard after him. He was a man after God's own heart, 1 Samuel 16, 7. So David went hard after God. And when he messed up, he confessed, like 1 John 1, 9 tells us, and he repented. Psalm 51, we can read his psalm of repentance, okay? But Solomon, who had all these great gifts, he didn't conduct himself the same way. He had this fatal flaw, and his fatal flaw was women. 
But another gift that God gave him, it says in 1 Kings 4.24, Solomon had peace on all sides. Besides Satan, there were no enemies coming after Solomon. He had peace on all sides, which David never had. It's like God took away these other distractions to help him, but Solomon went after the female distractions over and over and over. Solomon builds the temple. He builds the temple of God. He builds God's house. He builds this beautiful palace. He says this great prayer. Okay, when you read uh, chapter 8, Solomon says this beautiful, beautiful prayer for the dedication of the the, um, temple. God appeared to Solomon two different times. God appeared to Solomon. This guy had everything, absolutely everything. But we still got that fatal flaw in there. We got termites eating him from the inside because he thought he was the exception. God said don't, and he did. And then we get to the beginning of chapter 11. Now King Solomon loved many foreign women along with the daughter of Pharaoh, and it just names them the Moabites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, the Sidonites, the Hittites, all these women, and he ends up with 700 wives and 300 concubines. I told my husband, I said, that was probably a punishment in itself, having a 1,000 women to deal with. I think Dan heard his neck nodding when I said that, okay? But look what Solomon does. God says, don't. Why is this guy in the whole world? Did he think he was the exception? Did he think he could navigate his way through this? So he ends up with all these women. And and right there again, we're told, it was said, the Lord had said to the people of Israel in verse 2, you shall not enter into marriage with them, neither shall they with you, for surely they will turn your heart after other gods. God, it was spelled out in the do's and don'ts, but Solomon didn't take God's word at face value. And and this is what's so sad. At the end of verse 2, Solomon clung to these in love. He clung to them. His his hands were gripping tight onto these foreign women, onto the idolatry that he led him into. He was building sites around Israel for them to worship foreign gods in. Solomon's sin led to the pollution of the promised land. There's all these shrines to foreign gods there. They, he built a shrine to Molech. Molech was the, the fake god that you had to sacrifice your firstborn to. Okay, he did awful, awful things because these women had turned his heart. God told him to stay away, and he didn't. How does a worm get inside of an apple? I don't know if you're noticing it now, too, with all the apples we have around because the trees are blooming. How does a worm get in, out inside? And sometimes you'll look, there's not a wormhole on the outside. And you take a big old bite, and there's the brown wormhole in there. You're wondering how that happened, okay? Scientists have discovered that the worm comes from the inside. Well, how did he get in there? Simple, an insect lays an egg in an apple blossom. Sometime later, the worm hatches in the heart of the apple, and then it eats its way out. Sin, like the worm, begins in the heart and works its way out through thoughts and actions and words. That's what happened to Solomon, okay? It started in and came out. And look what he does. Look at the gifts he squanders. God gave him all these incredible gifts, and he squandered them all. He he compromised his wisdom. He compromised his walk. Can you imagine what his countrymen thought, what the other Israelites thought when he prayed that incredible prayer in chapter 8, this beautiful prayer at the dedication of the temple? But here's a guy with a thousand women. When God said, don't do that, what do you do to your witness? What do you do to your witness? He, he compromised his worship. So he compromised his wisdom, his walk, his worship, his witness, all of it. And he knew. He knew God's words, and he didn't do it. There's things that can hurt us and that can get into our hearts and lead us into sin. One is unresolved guilt, okay? Feeling like we owe something because of this guilt we carry inside for something we did. If you are feeling guilt, it is not from God, it's from Satan. Bottom line. If you have guilt, it's not from God, it's from Satan. Because God says, Romans 8, 1, there's no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ. And and we always, you know, we memorize John 3, 16, but what about John 3, 17? For Jesus didn't come into the world to condemn the world, he came into the world to save us. Okay, so if there's this guilt going on, It needs to be confessed and repented of because it is not. That's opening your heart to Satan. 
if you're carrying guilt, guilt around, if you're not guarding against that. Remember that Edgar Allan Poe story, The Telltale, Telltale Heart? The main character commits murder. Unable to escape the haunting guilt of his deed, he begins to hear the heartbeat of the victim he buried in his basement. A cold sweat covers him as he hears the beat, beat, beat of a heart. It goes on relentlessly. Ultimately, the heartbeat drives him mad, absolutely mad. He didn't, he, not knowing that it wasn't coming from the dead body in the basement, but from his heart in his own chest. He was so guilt-ridden. Guilt in our hearts. We need to guard against that. Guilt is not from God. Confess and repent, whatever it is. Anger in our hearts. Remember, for his gump, he goes to Jenny, with Jenny to the house she had grown up in. And all the things came back, all the anger of how she'd been abused in that house and what had happened to her. And she picks up rocks and starts throwing it at the house and breaks windows and stuff. And Forrest just looks at her and says, sometimes there's just not enough rocks. We, we can say that too, huh? But we talked last time we were together about forgiveness. And it can be such a hard thing to do, but God tells us we have to. In Ephesians 4.32, forgive as God in Christ forgave you. And you're going, but Lord, this is a big one. I'm having trouble getting over this. This, this has scarred my soul. I don't think it's ever going to go away. You give it to him and you ask him to help you. If he's commanded us to forgive, which he has repeatedly done, he will help you to do it. If he's commanded you to forgive, he will help you to do it because here we go again. We're not the exception. We got to do the do's and don't do the don'ts. He tells us to forgive. We need to forgive. Incredibly hard, so we ask his help because with God, all things are possible. So if there's anger in your heart, guard against that. Get right. And, and just, the, you know, throw yourself on the mercy of the court. Lord, I am so sorry. I love you. I want to obey you. But I know I'm not getting this done. I can't do it without you. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Jesus already knows. Right? John 15, 5. So you just go, you got to help me. Greed. Don't let greed get in your heart. We have to guard against it. Like I said, I'm just giving some examples. Luke 12, 15, guard against all kinds of greed. You know how they, remember, you've, I'm sure you've heard the little thing, how they catch monkeys. They put something, they kind of bury this jar with something a monkey wants really bad, like a coconut at the bottom, and the monkey sticks its hand in and grabs the coconut, but he's trapped because he can't pull his hand out while it's holding on to the coconut. But he's so greedy, he won't let go. If he, just look at the picture there, if he would just let go of it, he would be free. It's for freedom that we've been set free, Galatians 1.5, right? But he won't let go of that, so he's trapped. That's what sin does. That's what greed does. When we grab onto something and won't let go, we are trapped. Same as when we grab onto unforgiveness. It just keeps building. Luke 12.21, so is he that lays up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. We need to let go of the greed and jealousy. Don't do it. Look at Cain. He looked at Abel, and he was jealous. Quit looking around and look at God, okay? Jealousy, it's Romans 13, 13. Basically, it says, don't do it. Don't be jealous. At the root of jealousy is the notion that somebody's received what you think you deserve, and you question God as to why. Really, you're, you're blaming him when you're jealous of somebody else. You deserve that prom promotion, you worked harder, you put in overtime, you sacrificed family time. This undeserving person got it and you didn't. Do you know John Wesley's wife was jealous to such an extreme? It, it's so amazing to hear how bad it was for him and what an incredible ministry he had sharing Christ with people. True story, Mrs. Wesley was extremely jealous of her husband. His work set him in the position of friend and counselor to many women. Among his helpers and in the institutions that were springing up under his care, the churches, women were employed, and each one was for his insanely jealous wife an, ob an object of deadly suspicion. Wesley, on his part, was apt to be tolerant in a masculine, broad-minded way of the facts and relationships of some women, which other women, even at best, would hardly forgive. Sally Ryan, for example, was a housekeeper at one of his orphanage orphanages. She was a woman with a past. She was only 33, but had already been divorced three times and was living with someone else. Sounds like the woman at the well that met Jesus. But Wesley kept working with her, a fact which kindled his wife to fury. She stole John Wesley's letters to satisfy her doubts. She'd travel 100 miles to see who his companions were at a particular stage of his preaching tour. 
not when you could jump in a car and do that in an hour or two, okay? She would travel 100 miles to see who he was with. What was taking over her heart? Look at these extremes. Her fury threw her sometimes into spasms of mad violence and sometimes into acts of almost incredible treachery. She not only stole her husband's letters to satisfy her doubts, she tampered with them so as to give them an evil sense and put them in the hands of his enemies to be published. She didn't guard her heart against jealousy and look to the extremes that it went to. Look what it did when he was out there trying to do God's work. God incredibly gifted this man and Satan was in his home because she gave over her heart. God was knocking at the door of her heart. Satan's knocking at the door of her heart. And it's not hard to see who was winning this one, is it? So we talked about four things that can get into our hearts. How about let's just do four things that can heal us. Confession, ridding ourselves of guilt like we talked about. If we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us. 1 John 1, 9, what I love about that verse, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. It's nothing to do with us. And it's a promise. If you confess your sin, he'll forgive you. Confession. Forgiveness without requiring an apology. Okay, forgiveness, Ephesians 4.32, we talked about that already. Forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Giving, giving rids us of greed. That's 2 Corinthians 9.7, be a uh, cheerful giver. When you're giving your money away, you're showing how little it means to you. You're not that monkey with your hand in the jar ensnared because you won't let go. You're giving it away. Lord, you mean everything to me. I'm going to spend my money on your work and your ministries. That's how little it means to me. So the four things that can help heal us, confession, forgiveness, giving, and humility. We're going to be talking about that a lot. We need to have a humble heart like Jesus. Humility. So four habits toxic to our hearts, greed, anger, guilt, and jealousy, and then things that can help us, confession, forgiveness, giving, and humility. And, and we can all pray and say, where, what do I need to work on, Lord? Where do you want me to focus on this? Because really, when we're looking at it, if the wisest guy in the whole world couldn't guard his heart and had his kingdom taken away from him, what chance do we have? Well, we have a great chance at victory because we have Jesus. If we choose him, we have a 100% chance of victory. If we choose him as our master and the Holy Spirit as our guide, above all else, Guard your heart. Maxie Dunham said this. I thought it was really smart. We must be careful what we bury in our heart. To bury something doesn't mean it's dead. It may simply mean we buried something alive that will devour and destroy us from within. Kind of like the, the worm and the apple. Listen to that again. We must be careful what we bury in our heart. To bury something doesn't mean it's dead. It may simply mean we have buried something alive that will devour and destroy us from within. Like Mrs. Wesley, that jealousy in there. We use God's word to guard our hearts. Okay, he's given that to us. I will, we use God's word to guard our hearts. Bruce Campbell, he's a guy who climbs the world's highest mountains. He shared a safety technique that we can apply to our hearts and our spiritual safety. During a 21-day climb in the mountain, in a mountain range that includes Mount Everest, Bruce explained that there's no place to bathe and no water to bathe in. Sponging off and sub-zero cold is the best they could do. By the end of the climb, you could smell them coming. Bruce says he took, three, he took three showers the first day off of the mountain. Nevertheless, showering in Nepal's water was a danger for a Westerner. To keep even a drop of the polluted water from getting in his mouth, Bruce explained that he showered with his mouth full of purified water. Look at the picture there. Don't you think that's a great strategy for keeping our hearts pure? We keep it full of clean stuff so the filth can't get in. Keep your heart full of clean stuff so the filth can't get in. Remember Jesus talked about the radical surgery sometimes? If your right hand causes you to sin, what do we do? Cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, what do you do? Pluck it out. It wasn't about self-mutilation. It was deal this violently with sin. Okay, that's Matthew 5, 29 and 30. Deal violently and radically with sin so it doesn't get in there and start to sprout. 
You know, we went to, uh, when our guys were little, we were traveling somewhere, and we got stuck in Phoenix. The flight got canceled, and um, so we ended up with our three little boys and uh, needed a place to stay for the night, and there was also some kind of convention, so all the hotels are full. So we find this hotel. It was a national chain, and they had pictures, and it looked okay. And we go to this hotel, and I remember going into the bathroom and looked black mold everywhere all over the shot I mean I've never seen anything like it it was it would be hard to find the handle on the shot everything was just black in there but think about how it started it didn't start out like that it started out with one little spot right one little spot and that's what it grew to that's what can happen to us if we're not above all else guard your heart Guard it with, am I beating this in enough? Guard it with all guardedness, okay, before that stuff sprouts. You want another shower example? How about the orange mildewy stuff, right? That just a little bit, you gotta, you gotta clean it up every day because if you let it go, it takes over, right? Just step by step by step. And l- let's have a positive example since we're on mold and mildew here. But <laughs> think about, okay, Lord, please forgive me, but for what? Do you just just go to bed at night and you say in your prayers and you say, Lord, please forgive me. I, I do that. And it's like, well, what do I need to forgive, ask forgiveness for? Pride. I, please forgive me for my pride. Then I go to sleep. What did that do? Probably was prideful like 10 times that day. What did I learn from that? The Lord can forgive anything, but come on. Was I really sorry when I just gave it this big label? It's like this. It's, think about the ladies that don't have washers and dryers. Think about ladies in, that are in poverty-stricken areas that, that wash their clothes in the river. Okay, do they take their laundry basket down to the river and just dip the whole thing in and take it out and declare it clean? Or do they take each piece of clothing out and dip it in the river to get it clean? That's how we need to confess our sin. Lord, I was prideful today when I thought I was better than somebody here. I was prideful today when I said this. Lord, I was prideful today when I had haughty eyes, which I know you hate. That means you are arrogant. Whatever, you just take out each piece and you do it and you bring it before the Lord. That's what confession looks like, taking out each piece of the dirty laundry right before the one you can trust the most and asking for forgiveness. And it's easier to repent that way too. If we just do the big broad, please forgive me for my pride, well, how do you repent from that? Just I won't be prideful today. But if you go, but I said this, I'm not going to say that again. I'm going to turn away from that. I thought this. I'm not going to think like that again. I'm going to turn away from it. I did this with, the, with my look, the look on my face. I'm not going to. You're taking it out piece by piece and unpacking it and bringing it before the Lord and then turning, it, oh, turning away from it. You guard your heart. You go to God's word over and over and over. You use his word to guard your heart. Jesus did. Look at Luke 4 and Matthew 4 later. When Jesus was being tempted by Satan, what did he keep saying? It is written. With every single thing Satan said to him, God, or Jesus replied with God's word. It is written, it is written, it is written. One time Jesus even said, again, it is written. You go to God's word to protect your heart. How about our feet? Let's think about our feet for a minute because right there it, it, it talks about where our feet go wandering off into trouble. You know, I used to think Peter, James, and John were in uh, Jesus' inner circle because he liked them the best. Really started thinking it's because those are the ones he needed to watch the most. Okay? Wandering off into trouble. Where are their feet going to take them? But what does it say? Ponder the path of your feet. Proverbs 4, 26. Then all your ways will be sure. Don't swerve to the right or left. We talked about those guardrails. Turn your foot from evil. So Proverbs 4, 26 and 27, this uh, three-year-old little boy put his shoes on by himself, and his mom noticed that the shoes were on the wrong feet, and so she said, Billy, your shoes are on the wrong feet. And he looks at her and says, Mom, you're so silly. These are the only feet I've got, okay? We got to watch our feet. Remember Dr. Seuss, all the places you will go? You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself in any direction you choose. This is all true, isn't it? You're on your own. That part's not true. And you know what you know. And you are the one who decides where to go. Well, it was true up to a point. You're not your own if Jesus is your master. If you've opened up your heart to him, if you've opened up the door to him, and you say, Holy Spirit, tell me where to go. You are my leader and guide. Jesus, you are my master. You let him direct the paths of your feet. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19, the things God hates, 
feet that make haste to run to evil. That's Proverbs 6.18. In the things that God hates, at first it says the heart that devises wicked plans, but then it says feet that make haste to turn to evil. Be careful where, where you go. Psalm 119, 101, I have kept my feet from every evil path so I can obey your word. That's Psalm 119, 101. These next two are from Psalm 119 also. Verse 105, we know this one. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. 119, 133, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. What a great memory verse that would be. 119, 133, direct my footsteps according to your word. Let no sin rule over me. And then Proverbs 3, 26, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being snared. So we get warnings about our feet, but then we also get really good things we can do with them. You've heard this, I'm sure, Isaiah 57, 2, how beautiful on the mountains are the feet of those who bring good news. The people who go around declaring Jesus Christ and sharing the gospel, that's Isaiah 57, 2, 52, 7, and it's repeated in Romans 10, 15. How can they preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So Isaiah 52, 7, and then Romans 10, 15. That, that's what we should be doing with our feet. There was this elderly lady crippled with arthritis. She used to hobble to church on crutches. It was a great ordeal and required of her a considerable amount of toil and pain. A friend of hers observed her regular and faithful attendance and said, how do you manage to be at church every Sunday? And her answer was, my heart gets there first and my old legs just follow after it. Amen. That's what Solomon's saying here. My heart goes first and my old legs just follow after it. Let's make sure our heart is going to the right places. And I really like Psalm 73. It's... Uh, my fave, I know that um, a lot of people are much holier than I and they like Psalm 23 and Psalm 91 and all these other ones, but I just love the raw, real part that Asaph talks about in Psalm 73. It, it's just amazing. He just lays it out there. Psalm 73, he brings it all together, your heart, your mouth, your feet, your eyes. In Psalm 73, he starts out, he said, surely... God is good to Israel. And, and we're brought into that because of Jesus Christ. We become children of God when we receive and believe in, in Jesus Christ, so God is good to us. So he starts out with the anchor. Look at this. He puts his anchor down deep. He's standing on the rock, whatever Bible imagery you want there, but he, he just buries his anchor, anchor and said, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Buries it. God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. And he goes, but it's for me. Look at that. I love that. He's saying, but me, you know, I, I'm not good. God is good. I'm not good. And those, there's those who are pure in heart, but I'm not. He's recognizing his defilement. He's recognizing his sin. He's recognizing where his heart has fallen short. Okay, he said, but as for me, my feet had almost slipped. Which is exactly what we're talking about. My feet had almost slipped. I had nearly lost my foothold, for I envied the arrogant. Think about that for a minute. My feet had almost slipped because I envied the arrogant. I like the way Spurgeon said it. He said, it's a pitiful thing when an heir of heaven admits I was envious. Think that through for a second. It is a terrible, pitiful thing when an heir of heaven, someone that's going to heaven because they know Jesus, will say, I was envious. What do we have to be envious of, of anything in this world when we look at where we're going? But he looked I envied the arrogant when I saw the prosperity. So look at this. His foot almost slipped because he looked around. He saw the prosperity of the wicked, and then he exaggerates it. When you're down and you look around, doesn't everybody else's life look better? In those times, everybody's got it better than you. And that's what he's doing right here. That's why this is my favorite. He's so real, and he's so raw. He said, I saw the prosperity of the wicked. They have no struggles. Their bodies are healthy and strong. They're free from common human burdens. He's not cleaning this up at all, is he? They're not plagued by human ills. Pride is their necklace. They clothe themselves in violence. He's like, God, the saints are sighing Why the sinner, sinners sing. They've got it so good. The wicked are winning, God. Look at what's going on here. 
That's what the wicked are like. They're always free of care. They talk against God in verse 11. How would God know? Does the Most High know anything? They're blaspheming against God. They're thinking they have get, gotten away with everything. And, and in verse 13, Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure and have washed my hands in innocence. It's not worth it. That's what he's saying. I've tried hard to win a godly life, and it's not worth it. All day long I've been afflicted, and every morning brings new punishments. He's discouraged, but he went to the right place. He set his anchor. He knows who his anchor is. He's standing upon the rock, and now he's sharing his heart. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. They deserve the hottest tail, God, but you've given them the nicest nest. Have you ever thought of it that way? They deserve the hottest tail, but you've given them the nicest nest. Why is it like this? And we can look around our world, too. We see the wicked prospering in a lot of places, don't we? In politics, in great wealth, and all those kind of things. You're going, Lord, come on, look at him, look at her. What are you doing here? We're looking with our eyes. We're comparing but he said, if I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. So he's saying it would have discouraged others to say this stuff. So I'm coming to you, God. Boy, that's not a great point, is it? When you're feeling like this, when you're seeing things like this, you go to God. You don't bring brothers and sisters in Christ down with you. If I had spoken out like that, I would have betrayed your children. When I tried to understand all this, it troubled me deeply. And then verse 17, it turns. And he said, till I entered the sanctuary of God, and then I understood their final destiny. He got right when he went to God's house. He got his perspective back when he went to God's house. How do we do that? We get into God's word. We pray. We worship. We go to church. We get our perspective right again. Because you got to admit, he was seeing, oh my goodness, it's just a bed of roses over there. The wicked are winning. The wicked are flourishing. But then he went to God's house. He got into God's presence and he got perspective. You know, sometimes God will do that for us in different ways, whether it's during worship, uh, during a message that you hear something that just sticks with you, in your prayer time, in your, in your Bible reading time. It, it's like being lifted over the fence. Think about this for a minute. Say you were watching a parade behind a six-foot privacy fence, and you're just wa wooden, so you can't see, and there's this little knot hole, and you're watching the parade through the knot hole. And you see a flash of silver, and you think, well, maybe that's like a baton. You see a flash of brown, and, well, maybe there's horses in the parade. Well, you see a flash of gold, maybe that's a tuba, flashes of color, maybe they've got flags. But you're, you're trying to discern the parade from this, this tiny little view. And every once in a while, God lifts us up over the fence so we can see the whole parade. Just for a minute. And things make sense. That's what happens when we go to prayer when we get into God's word, when we, when we just give it to him, just like him and said, I'm really struggling. And God, I know you're good, but I'm not. And I know these people may have a pure heart. You have one, but I don't right now. And, and God, this is just so bad. I'm keeping it to myself. I don't want to bring anybody else down with me. But God, this is what I'm seeing. And why are you letting this happen? And then you get perspective. And sometimes he doesn't give it right away. Sometimes he wants to see our faith because the just shall trust, right? The righteous shall live by faith. So sometimes you don't get to look over the fence right away, okay? But you just keep trusting and pressing on, and he just gives us these little glimpses. Remember Job? Look at all Job went through. He wanted to, he wanted to peek over that fence really bad, didn't he? And he asked all his questions, and he poured out his complaints. And his friends were lousy. Let's just be honest. They just piled on. And his wife was lousier. You know, just curse God and die. That's his spouse saying that. And so he poured it out to God, though. And then in the last four chapters of Job, it, it's not God answering all the questions. It's God showing him who he is. This is who I am, Job. This is what I've done. And, and Job ends up, I, I repent in dust and ashes. Before my ears have heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. He saw God through God's revelation of who he is. Never really got the wise answer, but he saw God. We can do the same. We just keep going back to his word to keep our feet on the path. We keep listening to the rumble strips in our heart. We keep standing on the rock knowing that God is good. And, and I love it because God is good right here, Old Testament, and then God is good, New Testament, Romans eight twenty eight. In all things, God's working for the good 
right, of those who love him, you can't forget the next part, who are called according to his purpose. So even when things don't look good, haven't you ever asked God, how can this possibly be good? And sometimes he'll lift you over the fence and show you, and other times he doesn't. But so many times when we can look back in hindsight, 2020, I know in my life too, it's been the worst thing that ever happened was the best thing that ever happened. I've mouthed those words. This is the worst thing that ever happened to me, and it brought me to salvation. The best thing that ever happened. Okay? So that's, that's what this guy is pouring out. I tried to understand. It troubled me deeply till I entered the sanctuary of God. And then he, he sees it. He said, surely you have placed them on slippery ground. You cast them down to ruin. He's not looking with envy anymore. He's looking with holy horror. This is what you're doing to them. How suddenly they are destroyed, completely swept away by ter- terrors. Verse 21, when my heart was grieved, in Hebrew that's deep-seated t- sorrow. Deep-seated sorrow. When my heart was grieved and my spirit embittered, I was sen- senseless and ignorant. I was a brute beast before you. It's like I was like an animal, just reacting to the blows that were hitting me. And then he says that he brings it right back around again. Yet I'm always with you. You hold me by the right hand. We've been talking about that a lot. God gives us the opportunity to hold hands with him. But you hold me by my right hand. I'm always with you. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you will take me into glory. It's where we're all heading. If we walk faithfully with Jesus Christ, as our, we are all heading to glory. And how amazing that's going to be. And he... Point blank, in tw- verse 25, who do I have in heaven beside you? The earth has nothing I desire beside you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So as if he, he's this godly guy. He writes 12 psalms. He leads worship. And he went down the rabbit hole when he wasn't guarding his heart because he looked around. We need to ask God to help us guard ours just a great thing for that when he looked around we just said look at everybody else's lives look better that's why you keep looking forward i just love that little story about the big huge snowstorm two little guys out playing and they did all the little boy stuff they built a snowman they threw snowballs at each other did all this stuff and 15 minutes later they were bored right little guys and so they pick out this tree that's far away i mean and it's feet of snow and they said let's see who can make the straightest path to the tree And they both head to the tree. And they finally both get there and they turn around and look. And one little guy's path was pretty straight. And the other one was zigging and zagging and all over the place. So the first little boy said, why is your path like that? What were you doing? He said, well, I was turning to see what you were doing. And then I was looking back to see where I'd been. And then I was looking to see if anybody was over there. Look at that picture of our journey with Christ. You put your eyes on him, the one who's gone to prepare a place for us says, trust me, trust in God also. I got this incredible place for you. Okay, that's where you're going. Keep your eyes on him, not what everybody else is doing. That's just going to pull you away. Where you've been doesn't matter either. If it's put stuff in your heart that shouldn't be there, you confess and repent and you keep going forward. Fix your eyes on the Lord. What does it mean to see God? There was this uh, Soviet cosmonaut a long time ago. He came back from a Russian spacewalk and he remarked that he didn't see God. Somebody else said, well, if you'd taken off your space helmet, you would have seen him, okay? Or in the language of Dr. E.V. Hill, he said he was only looking in the backyard. We can see God in his word. We can see God when we pray. But we've got to guard our hearts to the end, okay? Don't ever let down. Satan's always going to be knocking at the door. There was this pastor on his deathbed down, down in Alabama, and he'd been a pastor for 50 years and he's dying. And his son comes in to see him, and his son ended up being a pastor too, and he kneels by his father be- father's bed, and he said, Father, you have preached for 50 years and have done more good than any man I know. The old man with a feeble but distinct voice said, Don't tell me about that, son. Tell me about the blood of Jesus. Nothing but the blood of Jesus will do for a dying man. He wouldn't let pride sneak in even then. You know, me dying, what I might have or might not have done doesn't matter. It's all about the blood of Christ. So like we've been talking, don't underestimate sin's power. Okay, if you do, I'm I'm sure all of us know our buttons, our temptations, all that kind of stuff, but ask God. Ask God to help you if there's something hidden there. Remember we did Psalm 139. Search me, know me, show me. The last two verses, 23 and 24. Search me, know me, show me. 
please help me guard my heart. Don't let that little spot of mold start. Don't let one termite get in because a whole lot more follow them. We've talked a lot about repentance and forgiveness because sin is like an enemy. It's like a cancer. It's just going to keep growing. Attack it when it's small. If you start to see patterns of ingratitude and bitterness and, and greed, and jump on it right away. Be like the guy we talked about, cutting off the arm, plucking out the eye, asking the Lord to help you. We are finite people loved by an infinite God. And that can be hard to grasp sometimes. I, I like what this guy said. Well, Tozier said, an infinite God can give all of himself to each of his children. Think about that. An infinite God can give all of himself to each of his children. He doesn't distribute himself that each may have a part, but to each one he gives all of himself as fully as if there were no others. We may not be under, able to understand that with our finite minds, but God can give all of himself to each of us. I love just the picture of this, intimate with the infinite. Thank you, God, that you see armies march and a sparrow fall. Thank you, God, that you hear a bomb's blast and a baby's cry. Thank you, God, that you can smell volcanoes flow and a man's sweat. Thank you, God, that you feel contours of mountains and a little lump. Thank you, Lord, that you taste the ocean's salt and my tears. That's how close he is to you. And, you know, we started with the tomb of the unknown soldier and, and what that looks like to guard what is most precious. Love what is most precious, okay? Guard your heart with all guardedness and give your heart to the one who's the most precious. I, I love this. Jim Sheeler, he had this book. He wrote Final Salute. It tells the story of Major Steve Beck. He was a U.S. Marine. You know what his job was? He had to go notify families when their service members were killed in Iraq. That was his job. Imagine that, Do, being the guy nobody wants to see, knocking on the door. He didn't just break the bad news and then leave. He would stay, that he could help the family through the process of funeral, supervising the Marine Honor Guard and, and all those things. The Honor Guard learns from Beck how to salute their fallen fellow Marine as they leave or resume guard with a slow salute that's not taught in basic training. The slow salute's not taught in basic training. It requires a three-second raising of the hand to the head, a three-second hold, and a three-second lowering of the hand, a gesture of respect that takes about nine times longer than normal. As in the military, it was always quick. You're going through the gate, somebody's saluting you, you have to salute, it's quick. This is a nine-second, bringing it up, holding it, bringing it down just as slowly. He explained it as a salute to your fallen comrade should take time. Indeed, those who are serving their country are worthy of great honor, worthy of a slow salute, worthy of extra time. To do some things fast just to get them done so we can move on to the next thing in our lives, that sends a subtle message of disrespect. So it is with our worship of God. God deserves a slow salute. The Savior who gave his life for us is worthy of our time and he's worthy of our hearts and we need to guard them and only open them to him let's pray lord i just thank you for the truth in your word lord i thank you that you make us aware of things we never even think about so that that can draw us closer to you lord i thank you that you're always there in the middle of the day in the middle of the night all the time and we can just come to you lord i just pray that all of us have gotten just one thing to think about that'll draw us closer to you lord i pray that we want to live lives that are worthy and honor you and, and just loving you with all of our hearts, trusting you with all of our hearts, and guarding those hearts so they solely belong to you. Thank you, Jesus, for the way you love us. Thank you for the magnificent, awesome God you are. And Lord, I just ask you, please bless and protect every lady and her family and her friends and her travel time and her study time. And just please watch over every single one, Lord. Please, as we prayed earlier, please bless and protect your people in Israel. Please bless Jerusalem. And Lord, thank you for the way you love us. Thank you for dying on the cross for us. In your precious name, amen.